1913, Washington, D.C., the day before President Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. The press and dignitaries are on hand. The streets are jammed with over a half a million gawking onlookers. The march, a massive spectacle of 8,000 women displaying their demand for the right to vote. Their herald, Inez Milholland, a New York lawyer, a young, stunning suffragist. The marchers, women from all walks of life, professions, classes, colleges, and states. Women from countries where they can vote, march. From Finland, Norway, New Zealand, and Australia. 10 bands play. 28 vibrant floats move down Pennsylvania Avenue. The peaceful, dignified, colorful march is suddenly interrupted by surging mobs of men protesting and obstructing the women. Men spat upon the women, slapped them in the face, tripped them, pelted them with cigar stubs, pulled them off floats, tore off their skirts, and cursed them. New York Times. Now there appears a gallant figure out of the pressing throngs, a girl in white upon a white horse, dressed in flowing crusader's cloak, Inez Milholland. She courageously parts the way through the hordes of men and drives an opening for the marchers to continue. Hazel McKay. The dignity of the marching women and the unruly behavior of the spectators creates press attention public interest in the cause. The march also establishes Inez Milholland as the icon for the suffrage movement. Attractive, intelligent, political and independent. This new woman rides astride her white horse into the future. Inez Milholland had been creating herself for years before the 1913 march. College, she was an outstanding student, actor, and athlete, and involved with the social injustices of her day. She organized suffrage discussions with her classmates and meetings with notable leaders. After being denied entry at Oxford, Cambridge, and Harvard Law Schools because she was a woman, Inez earned her law degree at New York University and opened a law practice to serve women and the poor and to help striking laborers. After she trained with the brave English suffragettes, she returned to America and dedicated herself as an activist for women's rights. Regarded as the high priestess of the women's suffrage cause, Inez led New York marches and was a prominent speaker. She proposed marriage to Eugène Beausevin while they were both on a transatlantic crossing. She was a free thinker, an international figure, a member of the NAACP, and a pacifist. In the two years after the 1913 Washington March, the Democratic Party in power still refuses to advance the cause of equal suffrage. President Wilson ignores the women. The Woman's Party, under the leadership of Alice Paul, demands meetings and press conferences, delivers petitions, and demonstrates in even more marches. New tactics against the party in power must be taken. In 1916, most women in America cannot vote. 
However, in 11 Western states, women have won their right to vote. The largest number is in California, which is crucial to the national voting outcome. The plan, invade the West and convince the new women voters to use their vote to boycott President Wilson. Inez Milholland is the leader and the main attraction. Her reputation, her dramatic flair and beauty draw audiences and fill halls. Inez travels through nine states in 30 days, giving 50 speeches. Often, the backs of railroad trains and station platforms serve as her podiums, as do cafes, hotel lobbies, and large halls. Her sister, Vida, who travels with her, reports. The trip is fraught with hardships. Speaking day and night, Inez takes the train at two in the morning to arrive at eight, and then a train at midnight to arrive at five. She comes away from the excited audiences, drained and drooping like a flower. Doctors prop her up with transfusions and medication, but Inez will not stop the tour. She will not quit this mission. She is heartened and healed by the power of her message. If democracy means anything, it means the right to a voice in the government. Women are as deeply concerned as men on the matters in our country. It is impossible for any problem that confronts the nation today to be decided adequately or justly, while half the people are excluded from its consideration. To believe that we have no part in determining national events is to believe that women are not human beings. Women of the West, you who possess the vote, use it on behalf of women. Together we shall stand shoulder to shoulder for that great principle, the right of self-government. When we reach Los Angeles on October 24th, Inez is feverish and failing, but robust in her intention to inspire those 1,500 gathered at Blanchard Hall. Elegant even in her illness, Inez speaks ardently with fiery logic. We are not putting our faith in any man or party, but in you, the women voters of the West. Let them know, President Wilson, how long must women wait for liberty? In the middle of this intense sentence, this remarkable woman crumpled up like a wilted white rose and lay stark upon the platform. Los Angeles Times. No transfusions or doctors could save her from the pernicious anemia she had carried for weeks. Inez Milholland dies three weeks later in Los Angeles at the tender age of 30. Newspapers around the country carry the shocking news of the beautiful suffragist's death. Outpourings for this celebrity and heroine fill pages of the press. Three memorials are held as her death is a cry for her work to go on. One memorial takes place in Statuary Hall in the United States Capitol, the first memorial ever held there for a woman. Thousands of her comrades attend. In her eulogy, suffragist Maud Younger emotes, the keynote of her life was hope. Her work for liberty cannot be lost. It lives on in the hearts of the people, in their hopes, their aspirations, their ambitions. It becomes part of the life of the nation. As Inez Milholland has given to the world, she lives on forever. Two weeks later, inspired by Inez's death, the Woman's Party pickets the White House with banners carrying Inez's last words. The picketers are arrested, 
go on hunger strikes and many are forced fed. The courageous and dedicated picketing goes on for 17 months through rain and snow and draws public outrage and political attention to the cause. Finally, on August 26, 1920, the suffrage amendment is passed by both houses and ratified by the states to become the 19th Amendment. Inez Milholland did not live to see the results of her dedication. Her legacy as a noble martyr for equal rights still inspires us today. I am prepared to sacrifice every so-called privilege I possess in order to have a few rights. Remember how precious this right to vote is. One after 72 years of marching, demanding, speaking, and imprisonment. We are privileged voters who stand on their time-worn shoulders. Now it is our voices and our hearts. Voting is the most powerful, nonviolent tool of equality in our democracy. Vote with participation and with pride. <laughs>